We're live. Go ahead, John Grossman. Hello. My name is John Grossman, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. And I'd like to welcome you to the first session of our fall webinar series titled Seasonal Round of the Ojibwa, being offered by Mr. Jonathan Gilbert. Mr. Gilbert is the Biological Services Director for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. He directs activities for the commission that include the work of 16 biologists, scientists, and nine technician assistants. He has also served as the wildlife section leader for the commission and has been the primary staff expert on deer, bear, and fur bearer ecology. In this role, he supervised wild rice, forestry, and invasive species programs. In his early years, Jonathan was with the Peace Corps in the Fiji Islands and the Ivory Coast, West Africa. Jonathan has a BA in biology from Washington and Jefferson College, an MS in fish and wildlife management from Michigan State University, and a PhD in wildlife ecology from UW-Madison. Away from the job, Jonathan enjoys dog sledding, gardening, and his apple orchard. We're going to uh, switch to his program now, and please hold your questions for this presenter to the end of the program, and then plan to utilize the chat function that you see at the bottom of your screen. If you have a problem with the Zoom program itself, please pose that question as the problem occurs, and our facilitators will work with you to help you uh, in this session. Along with all of you, we look forward to this evening's presentation by Mr. Jonathan Gill. Uh, oh, miigwech, John. Uh, very nice introduction. Welcome, everybody, virtually in this time of uh, pandemic and Zoom meetings. Seems like the way that we do business these days. And so I just appreciate everyone taking some time out of your evenings to uh, come and hear this, this talk tonight. Uh, title of the talk is The Seasonal Round of the Ojibwe. And um, so just to uh, set the stage a little bit. Here, let me go to the next slide. Um, I promise this will be the one slide with no pictures. All the rest have pictures. Um, so the seasonal round of the Ojibwe comes about um, because the Ojibwe people, you know, have lived here for generations. Uh, they came from the East Coast, according to their migration story, followed the St. Lawrence Seaway up through the Great Lakes, to the place where food that grows on the water occurs. That of course is manomen or wild rice. <clears throat> and so they came to this place, they found wild rice growing on the water and they settled here. Madeline Island was the center of their universe for a while. They spread out from there, becoming intimately familiar with the resources in the surrounding woodlands, wetlands, lakes and streams. And they became what we call seasonally nomadic people. That is moving from place to place through the seasons, taking advantages of resources as they become available. So these seasonally nomadic people, as they moved around, they practiced the seasonal round. So which resources are available for harvest during which seasons? And that's what I hope to talk about today, um, what that seasonal round is. I've just get, gotten a few examples of the species that are utilized by the Ojibwe people and presented that information for you. Um, I do want to say something about their treaty rights, though. And uh, Tribes in this area, the Ojibwe people, they have a right to hunt and fish and gather in areas off of their reservations on public lands. And that, in fact, formed the basis of their seasonal round, was their ability to move around not being stuck on the reservation, but to move around through these ceded territories and take advantages of resources as they become available. And this is a critical aspect of the life way of the Ojibwe. They, in fact, can't be Ojibwe people without practicing the seasonal round. So 
I have a couple of objectives here today. I'm going to go through the seasons and I'll talk about a few species that grow in our forests or live in our wetlands and lakes <clears throat> and talk about them and from an Ojibwe perspective, if I can, if you'll permit me. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time just talking about the species themselves because you're all pretty familiar with these things. They're not rare or unusual things. They're pretty common. But I want to share, if I can, some Ojibwe uh, language with you. So I'll give the name of the animal in the Ojibwe language. And I may share a story or two about each species, kind of a traditional ecological knowledge story about these species as we go through. And so a couple of uh, objectives here. One is to teach a little bit of the language and to share with you some of these uh, TEK or these traditional stories that they have. So we'll start out with Nibin. Nibin summer time. So Nibin uh, in the summertime in June is when Wigwasitig, Wigwasitig is harvested or paper birch. Um, it's harvested in June and we call that the summer bark. And many of you have harvested, I think, uh, birch bark. In June, bark pops off the tree if you cut it just right. Uh, it just pops right off and it's easy to gather up. And you can see some of the examples here of uh, uh, people who are harvesting birch and Marvin Defoe there on the lower left, who's rolling up that uh, piece of birch bark that he just cut off that tree that's just above him. Uh, different uh, seasons provide different kinds of bark. And so summertime is when most people harvest birch bark, but it also can be harvested in the winter. And winter bark provides different uh, kind of bark for different kinds of handicrafts. You will get used to seeing this kind of a slide as we go through this talk. I've tried to provide you on the right hand side um, the vulnerability of this species to climate change under two different models of climate change, less warming and more warming. And so you will see that graph on every, uh, for every species. And uh, we'll talk about the climate threats uh, that are facing that species, especially with Rigwasitig. It's uh, adapted to cold temperatures and snow. And so as those things decline over time, uh, birch may decline as well. And it's also susceptible to diseases, insects and uh, drought and deer herbivory. Um, birch bark uh, was used in a variety of ways for the Ojibwe, carrying, storing, cooking, etc. cetera. Uh, today, the uh, artisans that work with birch bark are the canoe builders. And building birch bark canoes is an art form and <clears throat> takes years and years of practice to, to uh, get that art form down. Um, and when tribal people go out to look for bark for a canoe, they need bark from trees that are very large. And those large birch trees are becoming harder and harder to find. And in fact, we did a search through the Forest Service inventory system for birch trees that are greater than 20 inches in diameter. There, in, in all of Northern Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota, there were 18 trees that the Forest Service had in their survey plots that were greater than 20 inches in diameter. So not very many. Those kinds of trees are becoming rarer and rarer. And the people who build birch bark canoes are noticing this and have told us this. And so it's an example of how traditional knowledge and their personal stories can help us as resource managers. Ninan, Ninan the blueberry. Um, uh, you know, harvested it in areas for generations. It's a big family activity. Even today, many, many families go out into the barrens areas and harvest blueberries together. Um, they're used throughout the year. They're dried. They're easily preserved that way. Uh, you can see uh, blueberries is not maybe a, tree, uh, a species that is highly vulnerable to climate change, even under the more warming scenario, it's still in that kind of that, between that green and that yellow, less to moderate. Um, 
so not uh, susceptible to climate change. Um, and the Ojibwe people have practiced burning for blueberries for generations. Uh, this is something that they've told us about um, and the Forest Service up in the Muckle Barrens in Bayfield County, they're, they've been burning to foster the uh, regrowth of blueberries. And I think more recently um, in the Apostle Islands on Stockton Island, they also have been introducing fire to that island to uh, regrow blueberries. And this was as a, as a result of people from Redcliffe talking to the Park Service and telling them that their fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers used to go out to these islands and collect berries and actually burn uh, parts of the islands to foster their growth. And so as a result of that, those stories, uh, Park Service is now changing the way that they manage the, uh, that island. Menomen, I think we all know Menomen, wild rice, Zizania palustris. Um, you know, this is the reason the Ojibwe people are here, right? Their prophecy told them on their migration story to go west until they found the place where food grows on water. That was wild rice. So it's the reason that the Ojibwe people are in this area. It's sacred to them. It's a sacred food item. It's uh, brought out at all ceremonies. Um, it's powerful medicine, they believe. Um, they have complex uh, societal rules for managing the harvest of Menomen. Uh, there are chiefs, rice chiefs, who go out and visit these lakes and they determine when rice is ripe. Uh, then they let other people know that it's now ready. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, the harvesting rules for wild rice in Wisconsin are modeled after the rules that the Ojibwe people impose on themselves with harvesting in a canoe with handheld sticks that are so long, um, made out of cedar. Uh, you know, in other places where wild rice grows, the rice is harvested with airboats. And that's not the case here in Wisconsin. And um, that's because the state rules are mimicking the tribal rules in that way. Uh, look at the vulnerability of wild rice to globe, to climate change. Even under the less warming scenario, it's highly vulnerable. And under the more warming, it's extremely vulnerable to climate change. And so this is a real problem for the Ojibwe people. You know, wild rice, it's not going to go away with climate change. It's just going to move north, right? It's going to move into, the, into Canada more so than it already is and, and leave its southern range. And so wild rice will continue in one way or another somewhere in North America, but the Ojibwe people are here. They are not, you know, they're in the United States, at least the tribes that I work for in the United States. They don't live in Canada. They can't move there. Their treaties and their treaty rights apply here. And so even though wild rice may still be around and move for the Ojibwe people living in this area, it is a definite threat to their well-being that wild rice may eventually leave this area. Um, I want to just uh, talk quickly about that fourth item under TEK binding, binding wild rice. So wild rice is harvested about this time of year, maybe it was a little bit earlier in late August, early September. At that time of the year we can get pretty good thunderstorms rolling through. And it always seems that, you know, just when the rice is ready to harvest, a big old wind event and a thunderstorm rolls through and hits that rice bed with lots of rain and wind, knocks all the rice down and into the water. Well, that's good for rice, but it's not good for the harvesters. And, and so um, the Ojibwe have devised a technique of binding the rice together. So accumulating a bunch of stalks of rice and then lashing them all together. And, uh, then when they're ready to harvest that rice, they go out and unlash all those stalks and then they can harvest that rice into their canoe. Lashing those stalks together keeps the rice from falling into the water if a big storm comes through, uh, creates uh, uh, environmental conditions so that the rice is, ripens um, more fully and, and all together. And so when they're unbound, um, the rice, you know, it can increase their harvest that way. But binding is 
time consuming and it's hard work. And people are worried that if a person were to go out and bind up a whole bunch of rice on a lake, does that convey ownership of that rice to that person who works so hard to bind it up? You know, so that's a, that's a problem. And that's, you know, something that has prevented the tribes from uh, using this technique. Um, there's a real question as to how that would change if, uh, if Ojibwe people were to start binding that rice. So, you know, no shortage of controversy in Indian country folks. And I uh, just wanted to mention that, that part of it. Um, yeah, okay, let's go on. Dagwagon, Dagwagon, autumn, fall time, my favorite, Dagwagon. Let's see where we go in our seasonal round. <laughs> so, white-tailed deer, here's the word, wawashkishi, wawashkishi, the Ojibwe word for deer. That per first part of that word, wawa, wawa means kind of a, a flashing white. That's what that word means, wawa, it's like that flashing white. And so, Obviously, the flashing white of the white tail for white-tailed deer is where that where that name came from. And seeing that flash of white as the deer is running away gave it its name, Wawashkishi. Um, venison, deer hunting, venison, important part of uh, the Ojibwe culture. I think venison is present at just about every feast that, that I have ever attended, um, ceremonial feast uh, for funerals, for weddings all kinds of uh, uh, events, uh, deer meat, venison is, is nearly almost there, always there. Um, shining uh, is an old time method of hunting deer. You can use today mostly on reservations. Um, traditional shining is uh, illegal off reservation, but various tribes continue to do that on their reservation. Um, the reason I have this firefly season there is because that's when, according to tribal tradition, uh, deer are ready to be harvested, is when the fireflies come out. So those fireflies are coming out in June sometime. And so when tribal members see the fireflies coming out, they know that it is now time to start hunting deer. can see on the climate change vulnerability chart there, white-tailed deer are not very vulnerable to, to climate change. You know, deer live all over North America, or at least all over, you know, from Northern United States, Southern Canada, and all the way down to Florida. So they're perfectly well adapted to warmer climates. So climate change is not going to affect them uh, too much. Um, some of the traditional knowledge we've learned about Wawashkishi is that it's a clan animal. So for those of you who don't know, clans, family clans, are a way that the Ojibwe people divide themselves up and assign duties for the tribe. We'll talk about some other clan animals coming up here later on in this talk. But the deer clan is uh, uh, the poets. Now, uh, they are kind and gentle people. Um, and so that's the characteristic of uh, the deer clan. There are not many people that are deer clan in my uh, experience around this part of the country, at least. Um, first deer feast. So the first deer feast is uh, when a young person uh, goes out, uh, shoots their first deer. It is their responsibility then to clean that deer up. Uh, and butcher the deer and then give away the meat to provide it to family, to friends, to the community. It's that person's uh, initiation into being a hunter. And so they, they need to uh, acknowledge that um, that's their responsibility. And one of the ways they acknowledge that is by giving away the meat from their, uh, the first deer that they shoot. Black bears or mukwa, mukwa. Um, mukwa is a controversial, a little bit animal. Um, 
they can become a problem sometimes in towns and villages, especially if people are not careful with their refuse and garbage and such. Um, but there are a lot of Bear Clan members in among the Ojibwe people in Wisconsin. And Bear Clan members will not harvest and do not want to harm bears. And so now you have this situation where bears are misbehaving in the town, getting into trouble, causing problems, and yet um, shooting them or uh, harming them in any way is kind of against the, the, the clan's um, wishes. And so how do you deal with a situation like that? Just one example among many um, that me as a scientist I face almost on a daily basis in trying to um, conduct my work the best that I can, but to do so in a way that's respectful of the Ojibwe culture and uh, of their mores and values. And so I need to walk a very fine line sometimes between doing um, my best science and doing it in a way that's respectful of the culture. Um, as I said, bears are a, uh, let's see, is it on the next slide? Bears are a clan animal. I guess one of the primary clan animals. Uh, their function is the protector of the village. They tend to patrol around the outside of the village boundaries. Um, because they are out and about patrolling outside the village, looking out for danger, they also become really familiar with uh, medicine plants and how those plants can be used to, for healing. And so Bear Clan members are, the, are uh, charged with that healing of people using plants, an important role that they, that they play. Uh, bear fat is another medicine that they get from makwa. Um, bear fat is rendered, it's boiled down, and then, uh, and then solidifies, and fat is then uh, rubbed on uh, aches and pains and uh, used, as a healing, used in healing that way. As you see on the graph on the right-hand side, uh, Makwa is not very susceptible to climate change as there are black bears that range far south from here. Wajansk, Wajansk the muskrat. So this animal is really an interesting animal. Um, the Ojibwe's have a very cool story about that. Um, they're trapped in the fall. Their hides are used for clothing and regalia and so on. But um, the, I want to talk, I want to tell you this story about Wajansk and its role in the flood story of the Ojibwe. So many cultures around the world have flood stories about floods that destroy the earth. The Ojibwe also have a story like that. And the great spirit saw that there was bad things going on and caused this flood to come and cover all of the world. And um, uh, only uh, there was only a few animals uh, that were that were surviving, and they were with uh, they were with Winnebuju on a, on a log, and it was all water everywhere. And the animals in Winnebuju were floating on this log, and and, and they were just wondering what would they do? How how are they gonna how are they gonna overcome this this flood? How are they gonna get out of that? And um, uh, when Bouger said, "Well, if I just had a little bit of soil, I could use that soil to to uh, recreate the earth again." Um, but it was all water everywhere. It was all flooded. Um, and so the loon came up to them, and the loon said, "Well, if I dive down to the bottom and grab some soil, I can bring that up to you." So the loon dove down was gone for a while, came back up and said, no, it was just impossible, it was too much. He, he just couldn't reach the bottom, it was too deep. Um, next came the otter. The otter came and said, well, I'm, I, can, I can swim really deep. I'll go down and I'll get some soil. And so the otter dove down, was gone for a really long time, came back up, he was nearly exhausted, and just said it was just way too deep. I could not, I could not reach the bottom. Um, and then the little old muskrat came up and he said, well, let me try. And all the animals kind of snickered and laughed at him. 
you know, you're such a little thing that the loon and the otter, they could not reach the bottom. How do you think you were going to do that? And so the, otter, the, the, the muskrat said, yeah, well, let me try. Let me try. So he dove into the water and dove down. And he was gone for a really long time. And all the animals were getting really worried. And he was just taking so long. He's not coming back. He's not coming back. And finally, after a long time, um, uh, the muskrat came back up to the surface and the animal grabbed him and kind of put him over onto a log. But they found that he had passed away. He had expired. He was down there too long and he drowned. And uh, the animals were mourning that. They were just sad that the muskrat had drowned. And then they opened up his little paw and they found in the paw was a little bit of soil that he had gone down to the bottom and grabbed that soil and brought it back up. And Winnebuju took that soil then and put it on the back of the turtle, put it on the back of the turtle and the floodwaters receded and the land came back again. And it was because that, uh, that muskrat had gone down and, and saved the world that way, gotten that soil and brought him back up. And when Winnebuju put him, put that soil on the back of the turtle. That's why they talk about this place as Turtle Island. Turtle Island because that soil that was placed on the turtle's back to recreate the earth after the great flood. So just a, an example of the kind of stories that surround some of these, these animals and plants. Biboon, biboon, winter time, time when I can get out with my sled dogs and run. Um, the time when I can study that Martin that's up there on the right uh, upper right hand corner of the slide, uh, one of my favorite research animals, the American Martin, one of the only uh, the only state endangered mammal in Wisconsin. So Beboon, let's see where we go with Beboon. Ah, the Waboos, Waboos, the snowshoe hare, um, harvested in fall and the winter, and uh, Ojibwe people that I know snare rabbits, snare sn snare hares. And I'll put uh, snares out in the past. They were made out of bas basswood bark. I don't know if you didn't know that you can uh, uh, create twine out of the bark of a basswood tree. And so they use that to snare these uh, snowshoe hares. Um, recently, you know, people have graduated away from basswood bark and they're now using uh, pitcher, wire, uh, pitcher wires uh, to create their snares. It's an important species. A couple of points I want to make with this. Um, first, let's look at that TEK section. Uh, so look at what it says there. Um, the Waboos told Minabuju, I will sense when the Anishinaabe are struggling to find food. Whenever, sorry the typo, whenever I see a round snare, that is where I will put my head. That is how much I care about the Anishinaabe. The Anishinaabe will know how to use my gift like my white fur. When they get a skin rash, they will use my fur. I will not be far away. All they need to do is look around and they will see my trail. So um, people recognizing that snowshoe hares are an important food source and that they can use uh, other parts of the hares for other uh, purposes. Also, it's this, is sent, this sentence or this little paragraph is from the perspective of the hare himself. It's the hare that cares about the Anishinaabe and agrees to give up his life to uh, meet the needs of the Anishinaabe. So there, it's, a, it's a story that is familiar to uh, Ojibwe people. They believe that the animals have made a treaty with the Anishinaabe that the treaty says that the animals will look out for and care for and provide for the uh, Ojibwe people. And in return, the Ojibwe people should uh, recognize, should respect uh, uh, the species that's giving up his life. So it's this mutual agreement, animals giving up themselves to care for the Ojibwe and the Ojibwe uh, recognizing that sacrifice and um, you know, honoring and respecting those species. So an important story there told in just a few sentences. Um, snowshoe hare is very susceptible to climate change. Look at that more warming model showing extreme vulnerability. 
And um, the way that we're seeing this play out, um, and this has come out just kind of recently in the past few years, is this whole idea of a pelage mismatch or asynchrony. Uh, so snowshoe hares are brown in the summer with the forest when it's brown and they change to white in the winter when the snow comes and uh, then they can blend in with the snowy background by being white. But what happens if the snowshoe hares change white early and snow doesn't come until later in the fall? So now you have a white snowshoe hare on a brown background. Or what happens in the springtime when the snow melts early and the snowshoe hares stay white, again, you have white hairs on a brown background. And what we're finding when we study mortality patterns in snowshoe hares is that many, many hares are being killed in, during that time of pelage mismatch. And so that is one of the mechanisms by which snowshoe hares are going to be very vulnerable to climate change. Some very interesting research. And recently now they're even beginning to do some genetics research on that because uh, they're finding that there are some hares that change early and or later in the fall uh, that maintain that synchrony with the snow and so will those gen will those genes propagate through the population and it will that be one way that hares adapt to, to climate change we don't know the answer to that yet but um, yeah anyhow Lots of hairs dying during that time of asynchrony. Gizigatig, 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 Gizigatig. Yeah, that's a Gizigatig. So, um, Northern White Cedar, Gizigatig. That tig at the end, a tig at the end, you've seen that now a couple of times in a couple of these words. That means tree. So, this is cedar tree. Uh, we saw it on um, uh, wigwas. Wigwas is birch bark, and wasatig is the birch tree. So that's why they put that uh, little few word letters at the end is to denote the tree. Um, birch is a medicine. We'll talk about the or a cedar. It's a medicine. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But I want to draw your attention to those three photos in the middle there. So the upper left-hand photo is a winter lodge. So obviously, it's a lodge. There's all kinds of snow built, uh, built up around it. The covering of that lodge is cedar bark. And these winter lodges are quite amazing. So they put that cedar bark up. Um, they'll put an insulation layer uh, underneath that and with bark, birch bark on the inside. And so you have these insulated walls. Then the photo on the bottom in the middle kind of looks like a, a hole surrounded by rocks. Well, that's kind of what it is. So inside this winter lodge, they have this hole. Um, it's a fire pit. And uh, they've lined the floor of that lodge with rocks, covered it up with then some soil and some cedar boughs on top of that. They build a fire in that fire pit and heat those rocks up and it's the original in-floor heating and so um, people use that winter lodge it was the one night they stayed there it was 15 below zero outside and it was a nice warm 45 degrees inside now 45 degrees is not too warm but compared to 15 below zero outside it's pretty darn warm so then the question becomes, well, wait a minute here. If you build a fire inside a lodge like that, what about all the smoke? Don't you have to like open up the top and that defeats the purpose of an insulated wall? Well, they've devised a chimney. So coming out of that hole on the outside of the lodge is this birch bark chimney. And that's what you see over on the right hand side uh, before the snow is uh, came. So that birch bark chimney goes down and connects up into that fire pit and it siphons the smoke away so smoke does not fill your, your lodge, but you still get the heat from the, uh, from the fire. A pretty ingenious way of, of heating a lodge and I have to say I was very impressed when I first saw that. Uh, cedar, uh, moderately to highly vulnerable to climate change. 
um, requires cold temperatures, snow, and you know, to uh, um, survive. Highly susceptible to deer browsing. And so, as we said before, deer are not gonna be susceptible to climate change. They, in fact, probably will benefit from warmer temperatures, uh, creating an overabundance situation. Um, deer browsing on cedar then expected to increase. That will contribute to its uh, decline as well. Um, as I said, cedar is one of the uh, four sacred medicines. You can see them listed there, cedar, sage, sweetgrass, and tobacco. Um, cedar is used to protect lodges or houses, and so you'll oftentimes see a cedar bough or a branch hanging above the doors or windows in people's houses. Um, it's used to line the, the floor of sweat lodges or like that winter lodge I talked about in the, in the previous, previous uh, slide. Um, so an important species for the Ojibwe has lots and lots of uses, pretty vulnerable to climate change. Bobcats. So bobcat in Ojibwe, Gidiga Bijou, Gidiga Bijou. So this lend word here, this Bijou word is the uh, uh, Ojibwe word for lynx. So you'll hear people talk about lynx. The Gidiga part just means spotted. So it's essentially saying it's the bobcat is the spotted lynx. Um, it's hunted and trapped in the fall. Um, Sometimes I, people talk about bobcats and lynxes together as if they're really the same kind of animal. So I'm not sure that the Ojibwe really recognized the concept of species. Um, they saw these two cats as pretty similar and they gave them similar names. One was just the lynx, but the other one was this lynx that kind of got more spots on it. So um, many times I hear people talk about um, the lynx clan, Bijou Dodem, the lynx clan. Um, but they will also include bobcats into that when they talk about lynx. Uh, bobcats are not susceptible to climate change so much. Bobcats have a very wide range, all the way down to Mexico. And so uh, they are not gonna be uh, uh, threatened with climate change. Um, as I said before, the lynx and sometimes bobcats are, are clan, one of the clan animals and so um, the people in the lynx clan think they are, they, are, they are the most beautiful of all people. And so they also often tease people of other clans. Oh, I'm lynx clan and I'm just so beautiful. And so they'll, they'll, they'll tease people about that. It's uh, humor in the Ojibwe society. It's really, really important thing. Um, there are many uh, personal stories of uh, hunting for lynx and all. So I use this word debajamoin. Debajamoin is a is a story, a personal story, someone's personal story about hunting uh, bobcats. And I've heard many people talk about um, stories of going out and, and capturing these animals. So this debajamoin is another form of traditional knowledge. Um, it's, it's contrasted with the word. Adazokan, Adazokan are more like sacred stories. And these Dibajamoen are more like stories that individuals have had over their lifetime. One of my most favorite animals is the fisher or Ochig. Ochig is uh, related to the Martin, or the, they used to be the same genus, Martis, but now all our, those smart scientists, they changed the name of uh, Fisher to now uh, Penanti, um, or Picania Penanti. So it used to be Marti's Penanti, now it's Picania. Um, trap for fur, used for clothing and regalia. Um, fairly susceptible uh, to climate change, especially under that more warming scenario. Um, not as susceptible as the martin would be well it's related cousin uh, to climate change that animal is much more vulnerable to climate change than the fisher is <clears throat> but i just want to tell you one story here about ochig and what they call chiochig chiochig is chi means great so chiochig is the great fisher the great fisher is a constellation in the sky and you all recognize it there on that photo on the left. You know, we call it the Big Dipper. The Ojibwe people call it Chiochig, the Fisher 
constellation. So let me tell you a little bit of a little story about that, why that is, how that came to be. So the story goes something like this. It was a time before people and uh, it was perpetual winter. It's always cold, it was always snowy. There was never much to eat. The animals were always cold and hungry. And uh, they wondered how that could be changed. And the story came to them that the, the secret to, the, to uh, changing this was in the sky world, in the sky world above the sky. And so um, somebody had to go up there to find out this secret. And uh, there are stories about all the animals that tried. Uh, the wolverine tried to bust through the hole in the sky or um, the woodpecker that tried to peck his way through the hole. Um, various stories, but it was the fisher. It was the fisher that was eventually able to kind of dig a hole, dig his way into that sky world and entering up above the, the stars, up into the sky world. When he got up into the sky world, that fisher heard the most beautiful sound, heard the most beautiful sound coming from some distance away. And so he wondered about that. He started going towards that, that beautiful sound to see what it was to investigate it. And um, he went along until he saw um, some houses, he saw some houses. And these are the houses of the sky people, these uh, uh, people that live uh, up above the sky, not very nice people. And um, so, but they were not there. They were not there at their houses, but this beautiful sound was coming from these houses. And so the fisher went to investigate that. And he looked inside the house and he saw all of these cages in the house. And inside the cages were all of these birds. And it was their beautiful calling that was this sound that the fisher had heard, this beautiful noise that the fisher had heard. And the fisher thought, oh, if I could, if I could just release these birds and let them go down to the earth, that would break, that would break our winter and spring would come. And so the fisher, um, and, and he thought, and, and, and if we have all of these birds down there, if all these birds go down and spring comes, just imagine all of the good food that there would be to eat with all of the birds that are down there. And so the fisher opened up all of the cages opened up the cages and as he opened up the cages, all of the birds began to fly towards that hole in the sky. And they started flying down into the, into, out of the sky world and into the uh, world below. And just at that point, the sky people returned to their houses. They were out um, doing things and they returned to their houses and they saw that some, that this fisher had let their birds go and they were very angry. They were very angry at the fisher for doing that. And they started trying to shoot the fisher with their arrows. And they would, they would shoot their arrows at the fisher, but the fisher kept dodging them and they kept missing. The fisher ran, eventually ran. All the birds had flown down into the, into, through the hole, or down into the uh, wall below. And the fisher was dodging these arrows and running. And he uh, jumped down into that hole. But just as he did that, an arrow hit him in the tail, hit him in the tail and knocked him down, knocked him through the hole and he fell to the ground and he died there on the ground. And um, so the great spirit looked down and saw that uh, the fisher had died uh, after you know, releasing the birds and having them come down into the world below. And the great spirit then to honor the fisher's bravery and his uh, efforts, uh, said that I will, I will make a constellation out of you. And he picked up some rocks and he threw them up into the sky. And so this is what you see up there. It's the Big Dipper. And the Ojibwe people uh, see the fisher there with his body and the tail. And if you look really closely at the Big Dipper, next time you see it, if you look really closely at the tip of the tail, there are three stars that kind of point right down into the tail. That's the arrow that hit the fisher in the tail. And if you look at the if you look at the Chio Chig constellation, you will see that in the winter time, the uh, Fisher is facing up into the sky, like he did when he went up to get those 
uh, to free the birds. And in the summertime, the tail is stationed down to the earth as he did when he freed the birds. And so you all know that, you know, springtime means birds migrating north and those birds bring spring. And so that's what these birds brought to the, to the world was they brought spring and then summer when that fisher released them. So interesting story. I really like that story um, just from its uh, entertainment value. But so here's what I heard when I thought about that story as a scientist. Do you remember what the fisher said when he let those birds go? He said that they will be good food. They will be something good to eat down there when they get down to the below the stars. So here I am as a scientist researching fishers and wondering what is the role of migratory birds to their food habits, especially in the springtime when they're raising young and they have high energetic demands due to lactation and such. What is the role of migratory birds in, in providing for that? Is that something that I can test as a scientist? Can I look at and investigate the role of uh, uh, migrants on fisher food habits and fisher energetics? So taking a story that, that's traditional ecological knowledge kind of a story and turning that into a testable hypothesis that I as a scientist can take and investigate. So it's a really, really interesting story, and it leads to these really interesting questions that we have. So um, just an example of how I try in my job to take the stories that I hear from the tribes and apply them to the science that I do. Ziguan, springtime, continuing on our seasonal round here. Okay, maple syrup, maple sugar, maple sap. So here we have a really, really long word. Okay, so I wanna teach you guys a technique. I'm gonna teach you a technique for how to sound out really, really long Ojibwe words. And the, the strategy is you start at the back and you move forward, okay? So we, here we have this atig, right? We have the atig, we've seen that now several times with cedar and with birch. So that's the tree, okay? So we can say wa-tig, right? So that's the W-A-A, wa-tig. And we have, let's go back to the next one. Wad, wa-tig, wad, wa-tig, okay? You get the idea? Bak, wad, wa-tig, bak, wad, wa-tig. We're getting further and further. Z, bak, wad, wa-tig, z, bak, wad, wa-tig. And zinzi bakwadwa tig. Oh, there we got it. Zinzi bakwadwa tig. So sugar maple. That's the strategy on how to send out these really complicated long Ojibwe words. Um, uh, sap is gathered in the spring. You know that it's boiled down. We make syrup out of it. Um, make candies. Uh, I assist uh, a family on their sugar bush, and um, they make sugar. And you can see there in the center on the right hand side, maple sugar. So you take syrup, you continue boiling that down, you boil it till it reaches a certain temperature, take it off the fire and keep stirring and stirring and stirring. Eventually it thickens up, becomes like cookie dough, you keep on stirring it, and eventually it'll turn into this granular sugar. It is beautiful. Um, just our favorite way to use maple sap. Maple syrup is really good, but you know, you can only eat so many pancakes and French toast. Maple sugar, oh my goodness, it can go in all kinds of luscious uh, things, cakes and pies and cookies and such. Sugar maple is uh, moderately to highly vulnerable to, to climate change. There are people that are really worried about um, sugar content and maple sugar sap uh, declining as the climate warms. That of course would make it harder and harder to make uh, maple syrup out of that as sugar content uh, declines. Um, I wanna tell you this, so they, the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe people do have a story about maple syrup. And the um, story kind of goes like, um, you know, back in the day, back in the day when people would tap maple trees, pure maple syrup would come out of the tap. So all they would have to do is tap the tree and 
collect the syrup. And uh, the way the story goes is that the people became too lazy. They took that for granted. They became too lazy. They're not willing to work for their food and for their syrup. And so the Great Spirit made it so this uh, syrup does not come out of the trees, but instead it's sap and that it takes a lot of work cutting firewood, collecting the sap, boiling it down, doing all of that work before they get rewarded with their syrup. And so it's a, a lesson about hard work is worthwhile. Don't take things for granted. Um, life is hard and you need to work at it. So interesting stories that come out of some of these species. Walleye, Oga, not really a forest species, but uh, certainly a fish that grows in the lakes, lives in the lakes that are surrounded by our forests. Um, this is a very important, culturally important species for the tribes. Spring spear fishing, I'm sure many of you have heard about this, perhaps have even seen it happening on various lakes. Uh, spear fishing is one of the most efficient ways to harvest walleye. Uh, you know, um, walleye anglers, hook and line fishermen, uh, from what I understand, about one fish caught for every five hours of angling. On average, one fish for every five hours. I've been out with tribal spearers who are able to spear uh, one fish, one walleye per minute. So 60 fish per hour. So it's an extremely efficient way to harvest. Um, and in fact, the Ojibwe want it to be a very efficient way because they're harvesting for food. So they're using Oga to fill their freezers, to feed their families during the times, you know, spear fishing season is what, a month long or so. Uh, so for the other 11 months, they're using that harvest to, to feed their family. One, uh, consequence, one consequence of a highly efficient way of harvest is that spearfishing is one of the most heavily rec regulated harvest seasons in the entire world. There is, um, there are nightly permits that are required. Permit is good for one night, is good for one lake, and is good for one boat landing on that lake. Every person that gets a permit needs to use that boat landing on that lake, at the, when they come back with their harvest, uh, there are wardens and creole clerks waiting for them. Every fish is counted and sexed and measured. And then the next day, a new harvest quota is established based on the harvest that has taken place the previous night. So it's highly, highly regulated activity. Um, and um, we are very confident that spearfishing is in no way negatively impacting uh, walleye populations in the ceded territory. Not to say walleyes are not doing well, they are uh, um, under some pressure. And let's see, do we have a, yeah, so climate change, look at that climate change graph, moderate to highly vulnerable um, species. Walleye are a cool water species as while water temperatures rise, uh, there is less cool water for the walleyes. We call that thermal habitat, thermal habitat. So there's less and less thermal habitat for them because water is warming. Um, we know that uh, there are other fish species that are beginning to colonize some of these lakes, notably uh, smallmouth and largemouth bass. Uh, walleye and smallmouth bass do not mix so well. Um, bass tend to uh, eat the walleye fry and uh, walleye populations decline because of that. And so uh, um, it's a difficult situation with, the, with walleye in the Cedar Territory. We're, you know, we're working hard to try to figure out ways to mitigate some of these climate change uh, impacts and com competitive impacts with smallmouth bass. Um, but it is a, a diff difficult situation. Um, you can see up in the TEK part that there are uh, stories about timing, phenological events that take place. Um, what her mother, mother, a person remembers her mother saying that when the frogs call, it's time to harvest walleye. Um, well, that may be true uh, back in the day, but is that still true today? 
Um, are we still seeing the same kind of phenological uh, uh, co-occurrences today as we did, you know, 100 years ago? Uh, some things may be changing. And so uh, it's really interesting for us to try to collect some of these, um, this TEK, especially regarding phonology, so that we can archive that and then compare it to current day phonology to see if those things still match up. Interesting work that we do with that. And I think this is the last one. Jigagawans, Jigagawans, the leak. So um, um, Jigaga is, this, is a similar name for a skunk. And so this is kind of like the smelly plant that this means. And uh, so anybody who's, been, who's harvested leeks or ramps as they're called knows that there's quite a, uh, quite a strong smell to them when they're, when they uh, are harvested. Um, harvested in spring, during green up, right? Early, early springtime, used in soups, cooked with things. Um, somewhat vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. Um, depends on moist soil and minimal disturbance, a little, co little competition, all of which are affected by climate change. And you can see, especially in that more warming scenario, it's highly, highly vulnerable. We don't have a whole lot of TEK uh, in uh, related to leaks. Um, you know, we ask elders about it uh, frequently, and um, they don't really have a whole lot to say sometimes. So it's so it's interesting. Um, but we do have lots of what I call debajamoin. Remember that word, debajamoin? These personal harvest stories that people have. And so one story uh, that a colleague of mine shared was that uh, she was out harvesting. Uh, harvesting leeks with her grandmother. And um, you know how kids are with grandparents, you know, they want to like impress them, they want to uh, uh, get praise from them and all that. And uh, so this, uh, this young lady, she told me that uh, she remembers when she was out harvesting leeks with her grandmother that uh, she went out and she started picking these leeks on her own and uh, came back with a whole, a whole big pile of them. And her grandmother was just so proud of her so proud of her that she went out and did that and was able to, to harvest these leeks. And um, so that was a very significant event in this person's life. And so it's another example of these Dibajamoin, these personal stories, how they, how they uh, um, affect people and, you know, the memories that they, that they create. So I think that's the end of my seasonal round. Um, i let you read this uh, paragraph here. And I think the important point that I wanted to make here is that this seasonal round not only provided food and shelter, clothing, but it also connected the Ojibwe with their spiritual world. And so the forests here are a source of both physical nourishment but also spiritual nourishment and uh, when the Ojibwe people reserved these rights to harvest uh, in their treaties they were not only reserving the right to actually kill a deer pick a leak or take the bark off of a birch bark tree they were also reserving their right to um, engage in their spirituality within these forests and um, so without these treaty rights, the culture would not be complete. And so I think that's the end of my talk. Um, I don't, I think there's time and opportunity for questions. There so is. If anybody, if anybody does have any questions, you type them into the chat and we'll get them to me. I'll leave my PowerPoint up. So if you wanna go back and look at any slide or any species, we can do that. So. So this is Tom Giroux. I'll be uh, posing the questions from the chat, Jonathan, and John can discuss them. Uh, the first question is yellow bark, birch bark used. I rarely, if ever, see it used. So yellow birch bark. Oh, um, from yellow birch? Yeah. So uh, it's my understanding that yellow birch is, uh, the bark from yellow birch is used from time to time. 
Uh, personally, I too have not seen that. So I don't know anybody that uses uh, yellow birch um, in any of their handicrafts, but I know that people have told me about that. They've told me that that is used. I have just not seen it myself. Okay. So uh, currently how prevalent is wild rice binding on tribal lands and then on ceded territories? So it's illegal in ceded territories currently. Can't do that. Um, I have seen it very rarely on tribal rice beds. It's a very labor intensive activity, right? So you have to go out several times during the summer to bind up these rice plants, um, wrap them up with twine, um, you know, moving slowly through the rice field. So it's a very labor intensive activity and um, I just don't see people doing it too often anymore. But I do hear people telling me that it is a cultural practice and that they would like to see more and more people doing that. And so we're trying to figure out ways to put that into practice. But as I discussed under the wild rice slide there, that's a difficult situation. Okay, uh, is princess pine used? <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, trivia questions. You know, so let me, let me answer that this way. Um, I do not know a single species that Ojibwe people do not use some way, okay? They've used virtually everything. And princess pine, actually, I think, um, well, I'm not sure. No, I don't know. I don't want to guess. Um, but I do know that if I asked long enough and hard enough, I could find people that use it for something because, like I said, virtually every species in the forest has some use to it. And uh, I'm sure Princess Pine would be the same way. Okay, and then uh, from our uh, future president of the Forest History Association, uh, Ed Forrester, how was sap boiled before they had iron kettles? And please spell the name for white pine. A spelling test hmm. for you, John. Yeah, all right. Well, first I have to remember the name for white pine. Um, hmm, sorry, I don't know that one. Well, um, then do the uh, sap boiling process before yeah, our sure. Yeah, so the way that, um, yeah, it's interesting. So uh, a birch container, right, birch bark container, put the sap in there, then you heat up these rocks really, really hot. You put the rocks in the birch container in the sap, and it will boil that sap and boil it down. Well, then when the rock gets too cool, you take it out and you put another hot rock in there. And so the heat was coming from the rocks in the, in the sap itself and not coming from like a fire underneath because, I mean, the fire would burn the birch bark container, right? But, so that's how they heated up uh, water. That's how they made soups. That's how they cooked things is by putting hot rocks into the water um, while in a container like that. And uh, Ed also said thank you. It was a very great webinar, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, I had a question of my own because uh, I think I've covered most of the questions um, about the links. Um, you know, I always thought that was uh, more or less a boreal species and that its fortunes were tied to the snowshoe hare a little bit. Um, so might that not be a little bit more uh, susceptible to climate change? as opposed to the bobcat. Absolutely, the lynx is much more susceptible. Like you said, they are um, a boreal species. Uh, they rely on snowshoe hares, they rely on uh, deep snow to be able to make it through. You know, they got really, really big paws, long legs, so they're adapted to that deep snow condition. Um, and actually, um, uh, uh, bobcats will outcompete lynx. So where the two occur, co-occur, Bobcats are the superior competitor and will force lynx out. And so bobcats are not adapted to deep snow. They don't have the same size foot or the long legs. So uh, that's kind of how the two species segregate now is based on snow depth and temperatures. Well, as snow depth decreases, temperatures warm, bobcats will be able to expand their range north, which when they outcompete lynx will force the lynx even further away. So um, yeah, lynx are definitely much more susceptible to climate change for a variety of reasons than our bobcats. 
Okay, I'm, I think well, one of the points I was trying to make is that the Ojibwe people not, did not necessarily see a difference between those two, right? They were kind of like the same. Bijou, Giriga Bijou, same thing. Uh, I'm just trying to read a question here. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I think uh, Ed is talking about the uh, Ojibwe participation in the white pine lumbering era. And I think he's uh, kind of leading into tomorrow night's webinar where uh, Cindy Stiles is going to be talking about uh, the logging enterprises uh, within the reservations a little bit and some of the traditional logging that went on. But do you have any comments about that? Um. Well, I really don't know much about the uh, tribal involvement in logging, except they were probably heavily involved. I mean, they were the laborers, right? So I'm sure that they were heavily involved in that. I do know that reservations have a uh, lum have a uh, forestry program. Most reservations do. So they are also harvesting trees for commercial purposes. Um, if you talk about the Menominees, now there you're talking about people who have managed their forests for generations in a way that's totally unique and uh, very uh, much admired by others around the world. And so um, the Menominees definitely have a, uh, um, a sophisticated and, and uh, well-developed forestry uh, program. I'm just looking up in my Ojibwe dictionary the name for white pine. Hold on for one second. All right. So pine, the word just pine, just general is uh, Zhingwak, that'd be Z-H-I-N-G-W-A-A-K. Z-H-I-N-G-W-A-A-K, Zhingwak. And Bisandago, Bisandago Zhingwak is white pine. Bisandago, my guess is Bisandago means white, but I don't know that for sure. The Sandigo Jinglak, white pine. So go online, search Ojibwe Dictionary, and you will find out of the University of Minnesota the, the Ojibwe People's Dictionary. It's a very nice resource. You can search things online, um, help you with some of your language. Okay, I found one more uh, question in the Q&A. What do tribal elders say about the white-tailed deer that live in the Boulder Junction area, the white white-tailed deer that live in the Boulder Junction area? I have found on an 1850 map by Thomas Cooper with Wheat that named a lake White Deer Lake. White deer are sacred white animals deer. to the Ojibwe. Yep, white deer are sacred animals to the Ojibwe. They, um, uh, I don't know that they would, anybody, anybody would ever shoot a white deer. I don't know. Um, you know, never say never, I suppose. And everybody's different a little bit, but I know that white deer are sacred animals and uh, would not typically be harvested. Okay. I wonder, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you skipped a story in the, uh, wild rice section. And um, I enjoyed the stories so much. I wonder if you might go back to that one. And I think you probably skipped it to save a little time, but I just noticed there in the bullets. It's, uh, uh, there we go there. See that? The Winter Bruiser yeah. story? Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if I can remember. Let me see. So it has to do with um, uh, Winter Bruiser was, uh, for some reason, he was like, he was like sleeping or he was really, really tired. Is that it? He was really, really tired and, and um, he would wake up every once in a while. And once in a while, he'd look across the lake where he was sleeping, and he would see 
uh, all these people dancing on the other side of the lake. And, um, and he'd go back to sleep again, and he said, ah, I can't be, there's nobody over there. And he'd wake up again, and he'd look over there, and he would see all these people dancing on the other side of the lake again. And so uh, he got so curious about it that, that he had to go over there. And he paddled his canoe over there, and, and what he found was that it was wild rice that was dancing rather than people that were dancing. And I probably butchered that story really, really badly. <laughs> Sorry, and I don't, I'm not even sure if that's the one you were talking about. But. Well, uh, certainly I can, having been on rice fields, you can picture that it is dancing as it waves in the summer winds, yeah. so that makes a lot of yeah, sense to me. I think it was a good way to end our uh, webinar tonight, and I wanted to thank you oh, for good. sharing your things. Any last words, uh, John Grossman? No, I also applaud the... Uh, the presentation I think was great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to start uh, what we hope will be a, a continuing offering of these types of things by, by our organization, by finding this level of talent to, uh, to offer this to the well, Thank you very much, public. appreciate that. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Super job. Yeah, my pleasure, my I'm pleasure. Gonna... Anytime, you know, just feel free to ask me. I'm, I'm more than happy to give these kinds of talks and I really like doing it, so. Well, you will certainly be on our short list. Yep. <laughs> okay. Good. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Good night, everyone.